It's frustrating, isn't it? A child comes in with an ongoing musculoskeletal condition, and after a good exam, maybe some x-rays, we still don't feel closer to knowing why he's in pain. Now, it's hard enough not missing fractures when all of these growth plates are involved. It's even harder when there are no formed bones yet, just an ossification center, or really what you see are a bunch of marshmallows of various sizes floating in a sea of hand, foot. Now, it's true that developmental plane film radiology is a whole subspecialty in and of itself, and people come to us in the ED with a range of ages, pain levels, or injuries, and chronicity. It's understandable that We try to keep ourselves sane and our department running by declaring broken or not, stable or not, stay or go. We can sort of compartmentalize our knowledge this way, but it's limiting. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There's a lot more that you know. You know what I'm talking about. It's those times you half remember the name of the condition and what to do, but that it's probably going to be fine anyway, no matter what you do, I think. But what was the actual treatment for this? And what was the exact right follow-up? And what was that called again? It's killing you. Next patient. Today, we'll review some common pediatric non-traumatic musculoskeletal injuries. Really, a lot of this is bread and butter pediatric sports injuries, so we can better serve our patients and our families. Ready? You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. We could probably start a new podcast series on sports injuries alone, but... I figure if we can feel good about these next few cases we'll go over, then we'll be in pretty good shape. So, head to dough, case-based, here we go. Jack is an 11-year-old boy who was brought in by his mother for shoulder and neck pain. It's been going on for just today. Uh, Well, really, over the past week. Okay, okay, he's had this before. It usually goes away after a few days, but it's never lasted this long, doctor, and here we are. Now, a little bit of digging helped here. It helped to narrow your differential diagnosis somewhat, but it also gave you a different context. This wasn't an acute injury necessarily. And sometimes just a little further lines of questioning will help you get to the bottom of this. Really dig and feel comfortable that you can get all that you can out of a history from this patient and this family. Well, Unfortunately, all we really know is this particular episode. We're not really sure whether or not this is a chronic or recurring condition because we're not sure what those other episodes were. So let's focus on what we know now and potentially we can put it into context. When did this start recently? Two weeks ago. Okay. What were you doing at the time? Playing baseball. Uh Aha. Tell me more. You know... As an aside, it's really amazing the human experience that we participate in. People often are not trying to withhold information, but they preemptively edit or redact because they're worried about how we will react to them. Baseball didn't come up initially because, heaven forbid, that that might be the causative factor. Let's dig more. His shoulder hurts a lot. When he throws the ball. Oh yeah, by the way, he's the pitcher. Mm Mm-hmm. 
There's no trauma. There's no fever. There's no other findings on the good review of systems that you always do. There's no chest pain. There's no breathing problems. All of those things are okay. Really, you feel comfortable. It's really the shoulder and really it's pitching. He can't point to one particular spot with one finger, but when you ask him, he moves his hand around his whole shoulder to show you where it hurts. Okay. He does have some tenderness to palpation over the proximal humerus. You take him through passive range of motion, no real particular impingement signs, but to be careful, you do his near test. You remember this one. You stand behind the patient and you stabilize his scapula with one hand. Well, you take the patient's outstretched upper extremity, fully extended, and you put the shoulder in internal rotation. That itself may show some sign of impingement. If not, then you slowly flex the shoulder joint. And remember that both of these maneuvers will decrease the subacromial space. If there's pain with either internal rotation of the shoulder or with flexion of the shoulder, then there's impingement. In Jack's case, luckily, his near test is negative. There's no impingement. You go through the other parts of the shoulder exam to look for potential rotator cuff injuries, all normal, which, by the way, doesn't really surprise you because rotator cuff injuries in children are exceedingly rare. So you get an x-ray because it's the right thing to do. You personally would be shocked if you found any bony issues, but it's just wise. AP, axillary, and scapular Y views, all negativo. So you go back to see Jack again, re-examine him. He's gotten his NSAID. He feels better. He's gotten his x-rays. And you ask, so Jack, you're the pitcher. Show me how you throw the ball. He looks at you with some side eye. No, really. He hesitates. It hurts, doctor. Show me as much as you can. You're trying to be patient because this may just be the golden nugget you need. He shows you. Now, of course, he doesn't show you the full stride with knee flex and all of that. Just the shoulder. Instead of a closed front shoulder cocking his throwing arm back and following through straight, he shows you that his arm is really abducted and all of the rotational forces are lateral. And really, it looks like he's flailing. It just looks wrong. The truth is, pitching a baseball is one of the most dynamic and accurate processes in all of sports. It has to be accurate. It has to be forceful. It has to be repeated, which, if you don't do properly, can lead to... What does he have? Little leaguer's shoulder. It's also known as humeral epiphysitis. It's the most common in pre-adolescence to younger adolescents, about 11 to 16 years of age. The mechanism of injury? Well, you got it out of jack just now. It's repetitive torsional stress, and it's usually done with ineffective repetitive movements. Plain films you need to verify there are no other injuries, and after that, it's really just a rest and rehab kind of condition which may not go over too well with that family of this junior champion athlete who's very enthusiastic about getting back on the field. I try to explain that this is an important window of time for him to heal. If he doesn't rest, and unfortunately we're talking about three months of rest, and worse, if he doesn't relearn his proper throwing mechanics, his career will end very shortly. It's just not a sustainable type of injury. Now that usually gets people's attention. Well, well, well. Jack's mother told Ethan's mother, Sheila, that Jack had a sports injury and that you were one great doctor. She should just bring in Ethan to get him checked out. After all, they're on the same team, and Ethan just so happens to be the relief pitcher. Oh no, now he's the pitcher. Ethan is 11 as well. Similar story to Jack's, but he's had more elbow pain than shoulder pain. He was hurting so much today after practice that his parents asked the coach to keep him on the bench today. That, as you may guess, did not go over very well with Mr. Ethan. What's going on with this team, by the way? 
Anyway, now that you're in the room and you see a normal boy who is holding his elbow in a flexed position and he's sort of protecting it close to his body. If he were a toddler, you think this was a nursemaid's elbow. On history, the pain has been going on for weeks. At first, he felt his throws were just getting weaker and less effective. And that is possible why he became the relief pitcher. No trauma with Ethan either, and the rest of his review systems is negative. On exam, he has tenderness over the medial epicondyle. Hmm. There's no redness, there's no warmth, there's no irritability of the joint. He does have full range of motion, just has pain. The pain is much worse when you have him resist flexion. He really hates it when you try to do resisted pronation as well. So again, you're just doing your due diligence. We only see these patients in a window of time. We are there to look for dangerous, crazy things. So you order plain films, totally okay. And you again think, hmm, I'm really not expecting to find any gross bony injury. But he still has his growth plates wide open. He's only 11. So let's order bilateral elbow x-rays. AP, lateral, and oblique. And that way, we can compare maybe some subtleties back and forth, the affected limb versus the non-affected limb. The x-rays are back. You look at it, you're trying to maybe even imagine an injury there. Maybe there's a little extra widening of the growth plate. You're glad that you got the other side, the unaffected side x-rayed. And when comparing the two, it may be a little bit more than the other side, a little more widening, but nothing catastrophic, nothing that jumps out at you. Ethan's got his NSAIDs, his exam is improved. So, you see a pitcher with elbow pain, with medial epicondyle tenderness, with basically normal films, so he has little leaguer's elbow. Easy enough. It's also known as medial condyle apophysitis. Remember that the medial condyle is not fused yet. It's still an apophysis. The repetitive valgus stress on the elbow has caused this traction injury. The mechanism of injury is valgus stress. So in the anatomical position, the elbow is making an apex pointing medial. We can see this in pictures as well as anyone who does a lot of overhead throwing, like catchers or shortstops or outfield players. It's most common in the same population, pre-adolescence to young adolescents. And the treatment is similar. Rest, ice, NSAIDs. You almost never have to immobilize them. And if you do, it should really only be for a day or two and to very quickly encourage them to get out of that immobilization. Little leaguer's elbow, or medial condyle apophysitis, needs a little more intervention, a little more follow-up than little leaguer's shoulder. So this is when you really want to do more range of motion exercises and strength training. These guys also need some retraining in their pitching as well. Again, this is a repetitive stress injury. The repetitive stress needs to be abated. We need to correct the normal biomechanics so that he's able to uh, go through the range of motion in an anatomically correct position and not try to stress out those joints in a way that they were never meant to be used. That's plenty for us to know now, but it's a nice satisfying thing to know what the sports medicine specialists may say about this. It's nice that all of us in medicine and among specialties are consistent. And by the way, the families will ask you, and if you have some extra information to offer them for their longitudinal care, they're much more likely to listen to you and to follow through on any of your recommendations. Any upper extremity overuse injury in children should really focus on rehabilitation and prevention. Prevention includes pre-season strengthening of the rotator cuff with a slow graded return to throwing. They all often talk about pitch counts. So it's monitoring and potentially limiting the actual number of pitches in a day. Rest days must be respected. There's no catching up days. Above all, proper form of mechanics and if it hurts, stop.
Brienne is a 14-year-old girl who was brought in by her mother for back pain. Like the others, there's no traumatic injury. There are no red flags like fever, weight loss, or any neuro symptoms. It's really just a pain in the back, soreness. It's worse when she is wearing her large, oversized, jumbo, ginormous backpack. She brought it with you to show you. She's sitting in front of you with slouch shoulders. It really looks like a strain or a poor posture type of problem, but you're there to do your due diligence. On history, it's been much worse over the past two to three weeks. What's been new, you might ask? She joined an after-school program that includes volunteering, some group homework sessions, and exercise. Oh, exercise, what kind? With that question, Brian's whole demeanor changes. She sits up straight. Her eyes widen. They even sparkle. She tells you, gymnastics. Want me to show you? Which ends up being more of a declaration because she doesn't wait for your answer. She stands up straight, palms to the sky, and somehow arches her back to the point where she's bending her back completely. So the point where her palms are now on the floor. Her belly's up. She's making this perfect back arch. It's hard for you to sort out what is more striking. Her enthusiasm and immediately going to a gymnastics pose or her putting her palms on the emergency department floor. You take a moment to write yourself. Poker face is on. Brienne, please get up and please make sure to wash your hands. I don't want you to get sick. So her back pain is much worse with extension, but even extreme flexion is also bothersome. But a nice key here is it always improves with rest. Now, you really probably already have your diagnosis. Brienne did a great job showing you. But to be thorough, you examine her. There's no scoliosis. Her range of motion is normal. Both extension and flexion are fine, if not a little bit uncomfortable with the extremes of either direction. There does seem to be some mild, non-focal tenderness, not really midline in her lower back. You look at her legs. Her hamstrings are a little bit tighter than you would expect. The straight leg raised and cross leg raised tests are normal. So you think, hmm, I'm wondering if there's something going on with her vertebra. So, time to do the Michaelis test. Let's better call it for what it is. It's the one-legged hyperextension test. We're trying to see if there's any dysfunction in the pars interarticularis. Remember, that's the part of the vertebra between the lamina and the pedicle. And more importantly, it's where the part of the vertebra that contains the superior and inferior articular surfaces come together, where each vertebra articulates with the next on top of it, other than the interventricular space. So bone to bone is where you have the pars interarticularis. To test for dysfunction of the pars interarticularis, you want to isolate it as much as possible. Here's how you do it. You stand behind the patient for safety. Have her stand on one foot. Wait a moment to make sure she's steady and strong enough to keep standing on that one foot. Now, you have her slowly lean back towards you, and you're hovering so that you can steady her if needed. By standing on one leg and hyperextending the back, you're putting maximum stress on that side's articulating surfaces. Increased pain or symptoms is consistent with what Brienne has, which is a stress fracture of the pars interarticularis. Stress fractures of the pars interarticularis are also called spondylolysis. Spondylo, spondylo, is a Greek term for vertebra or spine, and lysis is, of course, breakage or destruction. So spondylolysis is the, re is the result of repetitive extension or rotation of the spine. So really any athlete can get this, but especially those who are prone are gymnasts, dancers, or figure skaters, but also think about linemen who stress their lower back constantly, as well as those who do rowing. 
The most common site for spondylolysis is L4 and L5. Plain films like AP and lateral views of the lumbar spine can help you to diagnose, but again, it's, it's really a clinical diagnosis. Interestingly, oblique views that are traditionally used to see the articular surfaces, they don't add much diagnostic value in this particular disease condition. It's really more of an adult thing looking for uh, metastases, for example. The lateral view is probably your most high yield to look for spondylolysis. If your initial films are inconclusive, you know, you can move to advanced imaging like CT or MRI, but truly there's no rush to the definitive diagnosis, especially in the emergency department, as these are stable fractures and the treatment is mostly rest. You may have patients who are very savvy and they may ask for bracing. The benefits to bracing in spondylolysis are controversial at best, and some experts will strongly oppose bracing, since part of the recovery, it's strengthening the paraspinals, which can very quickly become deconditioned in a brace. A referral to the primary care doctor with a suggestion of physical therapy is all that's probably needed from you. Now, we don't want to brush off patients with spondylolysis. I mean, part of the vertebra is broken after all. It's stable, but there is, a, there is a fracture there. You want to be clear in your communication with patients and families and not have them misinterpret your reassurance. Close follow-up is essential, but you know, acutely they're going to do fine, but they do need some kind of longitudinal plan, the next step. Complications in spondylolysis are not uncommon. If the bony connection between vertebra is broken and there is insufficient rehab, over time you may see a shifting of the vertebra one over the other, or sliding, called spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis. Again, spondylo, spine, liso in Greek is smooth. So, listhesis is a slippage. So, spondylolisthesis is a slippage of your verte vertebral discs. This, of course, can cause chronic back pain and even neurologic symptoms down the road. For, this re for these reasons, it's important to make sure that patients with spondylolysis, pars interarticularis stress fractures, have great follow-up and precautionary advice, hopefully to avoid spondylolisthesis or subluxation of the vertebra, a slippage. Max is a 15-year-old boy who comes into triage via wheelchair. I can't walk. This started just now when he was playing soccer for his school team. He went to kick the ball and immediately felt a pop. He points to his right hip. Hmm. On exam, he has a lot of pain. His neurologic exam is totally normal. You find some mild bruising and swelling of his hip, and he's especially tender over the anterior aspect of the hip. He really can't, or at least right now won't, range the hip at this moment. No other injuries. His vital signs are normal. The rest of his exam is reassuring, so there's no need for an IV access at this time. You order an AP pelvis, and a frog leg view of the hip. They're back. Mm-hmm, just as you suspected. A two centimeter displacement of the anterior inferior iliac spine, which coincidentally is the origin of your rectus femoris. Max has a hip avulsion. Ouch. There are a few types of hip avulsions depending on the site. So let's review a few. The anterior superior iliac spine is where your sartorius originates. Your anterior inferior iliac spine is where your rectus femoris originates. Avulsion of either of these comes from kicking something or abruptly starting running. An avulsion of your ischial tuberosity, where your hamstrings originate, 
comes from jumping hurdles or doing splits or a high kick like in martial arts. Moving down the femur, an avulsion of the lesser trochanter, where the iliopsoas originates, it also comes from an abrupt sprinting or hip flexion, climbing flights and flights of stairs quickly, for example, during training. And finally, an avulsion of the iliac crest, where some abdominal muscles insert, can result from an abrupt change in the direction of running or any other rotational change. This is why a good history that's detailed may be most helpful in figuring out how to localize the problem. In all of these hip avulsions, you'll find tenderness to palpation over the growth plate, and you'll also find an antalgic gait. Also, there's just going to be something different about these patients. These are not just the patients who are very sore and complaining and there's nothing particularly wrong with them. There's something wrong with their functional status. And their x-rays may or may not be suggestive, which makes you go back and do a much more detailed physical exam to pinpoint and get to the problem. If the avulsion is greater than 2 centimeters of displacement, then that's when you want to refer to ortho. But many of these even get treated conservatively, even if they're displaced more than that. Uh, they'll just need a little bit of a conversation or follow-up if you find them more than two centimeters displaced. Make sure you don't lead on your patients that they absolutely need surgery because the orthopods often will first observe and then decide later on. But for the first week, it's rest, it's non-weight bearing, it's ice, and it's analgesics. The primary care physician may order physical therapy, focusing on range of motion exercises, stretching, strengthening, and slowly, 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 possibly starting back to regular activities. Wow. It's been a very musculoskeletal kind of shift, hasn't it? But wait, there's more. Tommy comes in complaining of pain for a year. You braced yourself. What am I walking into now? You find Tommy, who is very pleasant and a seemingly asymptomatic boy of 12 with his mother, who is already upset with the whole process. Deep breath. With a lot of intense patients, you find out that the pain has been coming and going for over a year and that it typically lasts a few days, sometimes a week or so. He rests, he gets better, it comes right back. The pain is over the anterior knee and today it's not really a bad day for him, but mom wants answers. She's been going from urgent care to urgent care and been told his knee is broken or somehow dislocated or there's some other issue and there's really no consistency and truthfully and honestly in her defense it doesn't make any sense to her or to us tommy tells you that the pain is in the anterior knee it's much worse when he has to do pe at school so much so that another reason for this visit is a doctor's note so you do your due diligence. You start from scratch. You make sure that there are no dangerous diagnoses present. And part of that includes a good physical exam. He does have some mild swelling and tenderness palpation over the tibial tuberosity. Hmm. Now you're feeling pretty good about yourself, aren't you? And why not? You saw that this is a chronic overuse injury. He's a preteen, he has some mild swelling over the tibial tuberosity, and you nailed it. Yep, this is Osgood Schlatter disease, an apophysitis of the tibial apophysis, which will eventually merge with the tibia to become the tibial tuberosity. X-rays really aren't necessary for the diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis, but mother adds on a few extra symptoms that he may or may not have had in the past and his review of systems is glaringly positive, so you go for x-rays just in case. Of course, non-traumatic knee pain in a young person always gets our attention. X-rays in Oscar Schlatter disease are not really to make the diagnosis. Again, it's clinical. You've made the diagnosis. But x-rays are meant to exclude other 
crazy things like avulsion of the tibial tubercle, or for a tumor, for example, or to begin an investigation for osteo. So you're just looking for other badness that hopefully he does not have. On films, you see a ratty looking apophysis that's not avulsed. It's all consistent with your clinical diagnosis. Good going. Now, what do we do for these patients? It's rest, ice, pain control with NSAIDs, and reassurance, and also expectation management, which we're very good at in the emergency department. Some people find relief with a patellar tendon strap. Really, the best treatment is time and closure of the apophysis. Doing some flexibility stretching of the hamstrings and quadriceps daily, it won't hurt either. Well, as they say, good news travels fast and bad news travels faster. Somehow today, you've become the de facto sports med doc for your whole region. Olivia heard about you, and she's a nine-year-old girl with pain, also to her knee, and also for some time. The best you can sort out is about two to three weeks. Olivia has been doing a lot of jump roping lately. She and her two friends have decided that they want to go for the Guinness Book of World Records. Their efforts have mostly involved jump roping as long and as fast as they can in between group texts to classmates about their progress. LOL. Olivia is really upset now because when she got out of bed this morning, she has been having a lot of left knee pain, so much so that she didn't want to go to school. And even worse, she didn't want to meet up with her friends after school to do some more jump roping. OMG. On exam, you see a well-appearing girl who has full range of motion to her knee. At first, she was very skeptical of your exam. So you slowly gain her trust and convince yourself that looking at it, the joint appears stable. It's not irritable. There's no erythema. There's no swelling. And by the way, a common presentation of osteomyelitis is preceding minor trauma. So this is not just a throwaway thing. If she were to have a fever or more pain out of proportion with this minor, minor trauma, this is when the transient bacteremia that we have every day when we're brushing our teeth, for example, can then seed in the mildly bruised bone. This is sort of a known phenomenon in children. So this is where we do our due diligence and are careful and examine very methodically. Olivia's exam is remarkably unremarkable except for some maybe minor tenderness of palpation and swelling over the inferior aspect of the patella. Hmm, you could have sworn that this was going to be another case of Osgood Schlatter. She looks really well. She has maybe even a decent story for it, but the swelling and tenderness is superior to the tibia. It's on the inferior pole of the patella. Again, no imaging is necessary here because she has what I'll give you a hint three words sending larsen johansen syndrome or patellar apophysitis sending larsen johansen syndrome is an apophysitis of the inferior pole of your patella so there you go what do you do it's the same as oscar schlatter rest maybe a patellar tendon strap flexibility stretches, and time. What you wouldn't give for a good resuscitation right about now. Anyway, in comes Martin, a nine-year-old boy with, wait for it, bilateral heel pain, and wait for it, for over a year. It hurts when he plays soccer, and it gets better when he doesn't. And here he is. You know, it's easy to get annoyed and just send these people home, but there's a reason, of course, for his being here now in front of you. And our job is to find that out. And maybe they've been kicked around the system. Maybe there's some fractured care or access issues, or maybe it's just extreme anxiety. Who knows? But let's just figure it out now. Let's help Mr. Martin and at the very least improve our own job satisfaction for figuring out what this is and Somehow everybody gets to move forward. Okay, his foot and heel are normal. Hmm. 
he does have tenderness of palpation at the insertion of the Achilles tendon and a little bit of pain with palpation on the plantar fascia. Hmm. Martin, is the pain also bad when you walk around barefoot? Oh, it is? Double, hmm. You palpate again. The Achilles tendon insertion is where the real problem is. Now, you remember learning this before. It's very common in 8 to 15 year olds. It's worse with activity, better with rest. There's tenderness palpation of the Achilles insertion. It's another apophysitis with a funny name. It's severe heel pain associated with an apophysitis. It's Severs disease or calcaneal apophysitis. Whew. In Severs disease, you may have unilateral or even bilateral symptoms. There is tenderness of palpation on the medial and lateral aspects of the calcaneus. If you squeeze the calcaneus, they will hate you. You may also see that the patient has really tight calves. People with flat feet tend to suffer disproportionately from this uh, as well. Now, Severs disease is a clinical diagnosis, and so x-rays are not necessary. But the weirder the presentation for me, or the less confident I feel in the history, the more likely I am to get plain films. Yep, the apophysis is looking a little irregular, a little ratty. There are no avulsion injuries. This is a nice case of calcaneal apophysitis. The treatment for Severs disease includes rest, ice, and in this case also heel cups. There are about three-eighths of an inch uh, heel lifts that are useful to cushion the apophysis while it heals. People who have flat feet will need arch support. Again, this is not something that we're going to do in the emergency department. This is squarely in the privy of the primary care doctor, but it's nice to have everyone have a consistent message. And it's also nice to know what to do. It's good satisfaction for your own job. You don't feel as frustrated. The patients listen to you, and they're more likely to listen to your precautionary advice and other recommendations if everyone is consistent and you seem more knowledgeable about the subject. So, in review, just because the extremity is not mangled doesn't mean that there's not something wrong or even treatable. To summarize, a few biz-buzz recall associations. Little leaguer shoulder is humeral epiphysitis. Little leaguer's elbow is medial condyle epiphysitis. Spondylolysis is a pars interarticularis stress fracture. Hip avulsions can happen from any abrupt forceful movement. Osgood Schlatter disease is tibial apophysitis. Sending Larsen Johansson syndrome is patellar apophysitis. Severs disease is calcaneal apophysitis. So there you go. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.